So we're back for the 5 p.m. 10 year, 10 minute interview with LPA. Uh, welcome back to those of you who join us uh, for more than the first time. And uh, very pleased to have with me Remco Haxman from Color Capital. Hi, Remco. Hi, Raja. Good afternoon. Good, good to see you uh, well and uh, fit after a few months of uh, not having seen each other. So you've joined the LPA uh, some, uh, some months ago and um, it was great to host you here in Luxembourg and now we host you online for a little bit of a clarifier because since you came in December, a lot of things have happened in private equity and in the secondaries markets in particular. The reason why we have you on board is um, to tell us a little bit about the current evolution, but also because Color Capital is a little bit of a, a household name in the secondary space. Uh, since you've been around for over 20 years, the founder Jeremy Color is still very much present. And we chose you as a speaker in particular because you've been with the firm for 15 years. And uh, so you followed the at least two crises uh, since uh, you joined the, the, this fascinating world. So we're gonna spend at least 10 minutes together with three questions that I'm gonna uh, tell you over time. And then we will open to Q&A for our viewers who represent a, quite a wide range of our community. And I will be very excited then to hang up because we are hosting our first charity concert after this Remco, which I hope you'll join with a piano right. soloist. Uh, it's an initiative in Luxembourg to support independent artists who lost their income in the current crisis. So with no further ado, unless you wanna uh, complete this introduction about you, uh, I'd like to uh, just delve into the questions right away. No, no, thanks very much for, uh, for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Remco. So let's be a little bit generic. Uh, the, the, the subject uh, title that we chose today was Our Secondaries, the New Primaries. Tell us what this means uh, in the context of a, a very fast growing world of private equity, since originally you represent a small bit of it and now we know that about 90 billion dollar uh, worth of deal flow and transactions happens every year. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, thank you. That's, uh, that's right. Um, secondary started out as a very small uh, niche market within private equity, but it's definitely moving towards the mainstream now. But we are still uh, a relatively small portion of the private equity market. Maybe just to uh, quote some numbers around that. Um, since 2001, uh, we estimate that about $300 billion of, uh, of, of capital has flown into secondaries, and that compares to $8 trillion uh, in, in primaries. So uh, the secondaries market is still relatively small in comparison. Now, of course, Does that, sorry to just to keep these uh, matters in perspective. So you are about a 15, 20 billion house, and how big is the entire secondaries market? Um, the trans so the transaction, well, AUM, um, the transaction volume is about 90, uh, 90 billion dollars a year. And we estimate that dry powder is, is about in the same ballpark. So um, the, depending on how you measure AUM, um, uh, if, if you measure it by dry powder, it is about in that range, 90 billion. And that is a, a fraction, it's very small compared to the, uh, to the primary market. So I, I oh. didn't invent the notion of primary, secondary, and secondary becoming primaries. That's from Jeremy Collar himself. Can you explain to us uh, more about that? Well, I, I know he likes to uh, to quote that. Um, you know, I think what he's all about is that there's an argument uh, that says that secondaries should actually be larger than primaries. Um, you know, if you think about the public markets and think of, say, a share, you know, buying a share in a company, for example, Microsoft. Every time you, you, you trade, you're doing a secondary trade. On the public markets, uh, primaries are only IPOs, and they're a small portion of the overall market. So by that analogy, uh, you would imagine that secondaries could be even larger than primaries. Now, I would say that there's probably some structural elements to the primary market or to the private equity market. That means we may not get there, but it gives you an idea of the direction that secondaries mm -hmm. uh, should take. Yeah, no, that, that's helpful perspective. Let's go back a little bit in history. And I remember when I started in private equity, secondaries was this very niche segment that was only uh, used by distressed sellers, where basically you're a GP stuck with a stake, 
uh, or an LP st stuck with a stake in the GP and you just need to sell. So there were huge discounts which confirmed themselves in the 2008-9 crisis. But we've moved way, I mean, further than this. Tell us a little bit about how the market looks these days. Yeah, you know, I think that's right. The market has grown at an incredible pace. Um, I joined Color Capital in 2005, and the market was about $9 billion in those days. Five years later, it was $21 billion, and another five years later, uh, it was 40 Last year, um, I think you said $90 billion. Um, it's tremendous growth. Uh, about every five years, the market has, uh, has doubled. And, and, you know, one of the, one of the things that's really changed is you know, 15, 20 years ago, if you were an investor and you called up your fund manager, and said, I want to sell my position in your fund. Uh, that usually was not well received. Um, people worried that that was a, a reflection on the quality of the GP, on the quality of the portfolio. And they didn't realize maybe it was a reflection of the situation of the seller. And that's really uh, changed now into a situation where the secondary market is completely accepted as a, as a portfolio management tool. And so no GP will worry about an LP selling his position. It's really viewed as a as a uh, as a reflection on, on the situation of the center and mm -hmm. so that's fine and what i find really interesting is that what we're now seeing in the market is something quite similar with gp lens so gp lens are now about a third of the market depending on, on who you ask um i think as recently as five six years ago uh, gp lens was really uh, associated with poor and weak gps uh, gp led would only be done by someone who had no future and had no other way of raising primary capital. Whereas today it's completely shifted into the mainstream, blue chip GPs, the best GPs that we know, they use the secondary market through GP lens um, to offer their clients, their LPs optionality. And that's really become an accepted uh, secondary tool as well. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a growing uh, in sophistication uh, in variety of buyers, of sellers, of strategies. Uh, does that mean a very intermediated market? And I'm, I'm going to lead on from this into my third question. Uh, well, I have to say the C word for the first time. So C19 has been hitting us hard and I think we're still seeing the impact unfolding on PE. Uh, where does that leave you in terms of these different types of strategies? And uh, what does it mean for you as a, as, as a, you know, a big player in this, in this market? Yeah. Well, to start with your question about intermediation, in GP lets um, we tend to see intermediaries and we welcome them because they only work well if you have a, a process uh, where no one will doubt the integrity of the process. Because every side of the trade needs to be happy with it. If the LPs are not confident that the process had been uh, run with integrity, you will get no sellers. So even though sometimes we would like to buy stuff without an intermediary present, in GP net situations, um, it's, it's very clear that, uh, that you need one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's different from, from maybe plain vanilla portfolios. Okay, so what, so what um, does that mean, C19? Yeah, so COVID-19, um, you know, I think one of the one of the biggest dangers that our industry faces is thinking it's going to be exactly the same as the as the global financial crisis now more than uh, than ten years ago. Um, it's it, it makes sense because we got nothing else to compare it to. But but who knows? What we saw back then was that the impact of the crisis mostly went to timing and less to value. So multiples of cost stayed reasonably steady. Uh, but IORs really got hurt because holding periods were long. Now, but, uh, maybe, uh, so, but so are you saying that there are no distressed sellers? Oh, no, I'm not saying anything sellers? about, mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything about sellers quite yet. Um, we, so in today's market, uh, only uh, uh, investors with, with very acute liquidity needs uh, and that are forced to sell will sell because crisis will come down quickly because it's incredibly hard to underwrite transactions today because no one knows where this is going. So the volume in the market is coming down quite a bit because people will wait for a bit to see where this will lead to. So we do think that the market will come down or slow down quite a bit uh, for the foreseeable future. And then one or two quarters from now, when hopefully things come back to normality, uh, people will take stock and decide whether they need to change their portfolios or not. 
And what does that mean in terms of your uh, capacity to transact and deploy capital? Because I think you're fundraising for your eighth fund now. Uh, and it's interesting to see your perspective of how you approach uh, the, the deal flow. Right. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we have a fund that we're investing from. And so we're in the market and we're always looking for situations to invest. Uh, we're usually origination driven. So we talk to a lot of people in the market. And if we can find the right deal, uh, we will definitely do it. Um, it's just unlikely that um, there'll be many of them in the very near term. We think we need the market to calm down a little bit before we can start uh, moving forward uh, a bit longer. And I do think that the, uh, the long-term perspective of private equity is really uh, gonna prove valuable in this situation uh, because it really means compared to public markets, for example, that GPs can and will sit out in this period of volatility sure. uh, and give their companies the time to, uh, to recover. Mm -hmm. but, so Remco, you're a partner, which I should have said earlier, and the head of origination. So how does your job look different now? Because we are moving right into the Q&A part of our uh, interview, and I have two or three questions for you. Sure, yeah. So uh, I'm a partner in the firm indeed, not the head of origination, um, ah. but, uh, but very focused on origination. Um, and so uh, we continue to talk uh, to all our contacts in the market. Um, and um, and and be helpful where we can and understand what their uh, objectives are in this market and um, and and see how things develop mm -hmm. one question we get is can you please explain more clearly what is gp-led transaction it's not clear for everyone and i encourage the viewers to post their questions at the bottom in the little uh, uh, q a uh, icon that you see on your screen Right. So a, a GP-led transaction is where a general partner or the fund manager takes the initiative to provide liquidity to the LPs in the fund um, by selling uh, the portfolio or part of its portfolio into a new entity that it will uh, most of the time continue to manage itself. So it's about providing the LPs the option to either sell to a new entity that's then often capitalized by a secondary investor like ourselves, or uh, to, to roll the investment and to stay invested. So it's a liquidity offering by the GP, giving the LP the choice to sell or stay. Okay, uh, can you illustrate that a little bit more for us on how it actually pans out from sourcing to closing the deal? Um, the, uh, the structure is usually that, a, that an intermediary gets hired uh, to run a process, uh, a number of secondary players get invited to value the portfolio and to make an offer for it. Um, in the meantime, a structure is being designed. Um, there's, there's various transaction structures that uh, the market has, uh, has seen. Um, and then a period, you know, there's, it's hard to generalize because every GP-led uh, situation is, uh, is different. Um, but uh, in some cases, the GP can decide to, to make a sale or not. And in some cases, the LPs will uh, decide whether they sell or not. And these assets will find a, a, a new home in a new structure capitalized by a combination of the secondary buyer and the existing LPs with the uh, GP continuing to manage, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which is, uh, makes it interesting because there's lots of conflicts of interest to manage in these situations because the GP is acting as both the buyer and the seller. Uh, that's why the the presence of a of an in, of a of a process that's run with integrity um, is important. And so there's you know it's a it's a it's a complex M and A process. So that means not every player in the market is able to execute such transactions. And and leading on from this, another Q and A is about your uh, bite size. So what's your average ticket size since you're such a big fund? Does it uh, exclude you from a lot of the uh, potential volume that's happening in the market, or on the contrary? Um, we, we look at a lot of uh, transactions, large and small, of course, due to our size. Um, when it becomes too small, uh, it makes less sense for us to do. Um, the average deal size for us is uh, in the range of a couple of hundred million dollars, so call it 200 on average, but there's a wide variety uh, around it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ranko. Maybe a couple last uh, two questions, uh, Q&A. Uh, so you said that it's been very slow right now, that uh, the market's uh, almost stopped. What are the signs that's going to indicate you that you can restart uh, doing deals? And, and it's probably valid for you and for the rest of the market. A lot of our GPs watching you are wondering the same. 
Yeah, you know, I think almost everyone is taking a pause. What's really going to kickstart it or, or restart it again, depending on, of course, how, how things develop is when the Q2 marks come out. Uh, so when the valuations at the end of the second quarter come out, that could be a trigger point for, uh, uh, for some new activity. Because quarter one was not so impacted, I guess, for our industry. I mean, we've seen Blackstone uh, reveal their numbers, but they're a listed company, so... Yeah, I, I don't think prime. it it will really become clear the impact in Q2, and depending on how it, how the situation develops, maybe Q3. Who knows? But uh, as of today, it seems that Q2 will be crucial after which we can take stock of where we are. It's reassuring to see you're very calm and composed, so no panic uh, on your side, at least. No panic, no. I have I have another question actually. If you, if you have a few more minutes. Uh, uh, can you give us some insights on day on debt buyback of GPs? Uh, is there more exposure now that we are in these uncertain times? Can you say again? Sorry, exposure. Debt debt buybacks of GPs. Oh right, um, I'm sure many are are considering this, given where debt trades often at uh, at reasonable discounts, and and GPs that have the ability to do so and the liquidity to do it, uh, I'm I'm confident are. Uh, are actively uh, researching this. Um, how many trades have actually been done is kind of hard to, uh, to see from where I am uh, at the moment, but I do expect uh, some of that activity to, uh, to take place indeed, because it's a great opportunity if you have the liquidity to, uh, to do so. Okay, so maybe a final question to wrap up. Remco Color is in its eighth fund, so kind of a granddad in the world of PE, what, what advice would you give to first time funds that are in the secondary space uh, and in general to emerging managers who've never lived through something like what's happening today? Oh, um, what advice to first time managers? Well, they've, they've, they've picked a, a great time to, uh, to be a first time manager depending on how much they, they've invested to date because you know, depending on how we're gonna come out of this, there'll be lots of opportunities. I would say the advice really is to um, um, to to understand the uh, the portfolios that you're buying inside out because in 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 times of uncertainty like this, you just don't know uh, where the world is going and what's going to happen. And I think it's better to to be careful and pause um, than to rush into things. I think this is a great final word, Remco, because it's also a conviction we have at LPA that maybe the vintages of uh, 2017, 18, and, the, and 19 to some extent uh, may have you know, some difficult times in parts, but we really believe that private equity will do very well with the uh, current vintages and going forward, uh, because while everybody was talking about being very high in the cycle, um, valuations are going to be lower, which will give opportunity to people with dry powder. So maybe that explains why you're so confident and relaxed. Maybe it does. Okay. A any, anything you wish to share with us before we, we close? No, thanks for, uh, for having me. Great to see you. And I should look forward to the concert that follows us. Uh, that's really cool. Thanks for joining us. And uh, my next guest uh, will be... Uh, Actually, I think uh, Hedda Paulson Miller, who will talk to us about uh, impact and ESG next week. So enjoy the rest of the week and the concert later. Remco, thank you, and I hope you can come back to Luxembourg soon. <laughs>